Swinburne University of Technology. Hi everyone. In this video we are going to be comparing and contrasting quantitative and qualitative research and then we're going to be looking at the different kinds of qualitative research that are out there. So to compare quantitative and qualitative research, quantitative is where we have some sort of specific measurement. So normally the majority of our survey questions are going to give us quantitative data. If they give us a particular number or a particular measurement, if we have data that's in categories, uh, any time we've got any kind of experimental data that's also going to give us quantitative data. So basically if we can calculate a mean or create groups and calculate percentages of the groups, we would consider data to be quantitative. On the other hand, qualitative is where we have characteristics rather than specific measurements. So if we have an open-ended survey question where people can just write answers into a box, or if we have interviews or we have focus groups, and instead of trying to make measurements, we're looking for themes and patterns. So what kind of themes emerged from an interview or a focus group? Normally we wouldn't use either of these methods in isolation, so they're most powerful when we put them together. So our qualitative is going to be very good for exploratory research. Uh, it is not as structured in most cases. Uh, we're not going to have a spreadsheet which uh, has all of our data. Instead, we're probably going to have things like interview transcripts or focus group transcripts where we're looking for themes. It's going to be descriptive, so we're not going to be performing statistical analysis, but it can provide us very good insights because of the amount of detail that we can get, particularly out of interviews. You can imagine if you're sitting one-on-one -on -one with someone, you can get a lot more detail from an interview. On the other hand, quantitative data, it's structured. You can imagine you've administered a survey, you have a spreadsheet of data, uh, you've hopefully got quite a large sample size, and you're going to be able to perform statistical analysis. Uh, if we've done a good job of our sampling, uh, a nice random sample, then quite often we can use our sample to generalize or make inferences about the population as well. So now we're going to be looking at the different qualitative techniques. Later on in the course we're going to be looking at uh, quantitative data and the analysis uh, that we do with it, uh, but for the rest of today we're going to be looking at the different qualitative approaches. And as I said before, the two, the two methods, quantitative and qualitative, strongest when we are putting them together, using them together, so we're going to have measured data from say a survey, might have a big sample size, but then we'll have smaller group where maybe we do some focus groups or some interviews and we get some in-depth data and the two will complement each other. So looking at our qualitative techniques we can divide them into direct and indirect. So the direct methods are our more traditional ones, so our focus groups and our in-depth interviews and our indirect is a collection of techniques that we call projective techniques and they're quite quite a broad range of different things and I'll talk about those a little bit later. So a focus group is where we have maybe normally about eight to ten, sometimes it might be a bit smaller, we might have four or five or six uh, participants. You normally wouldn't go beyond say about twelve uh, because it would just be too difficult to give everyone a say. Uh, and so we'll bring them in and it's kind of like an interview with a whole lot of people there. Normally takes about one to three hours um, and I've set a homogenous group so that would mean we're getting people who are similar to one another in, uh, but that can vary. Sometimes we might be doing a study and we might have each person um, we kind of consider to be representative of a particular group. So we might have a group of different kinds of people uh, or we might have several groups, but within each group we have more similar kinds of people um, just to avoid conflict and clashes of opinion. So it depends what we, we're trying to collect as to which way around we go with that. So when we are conducting a focus group, we normally kind of take what we call a funnel approach. 
So we start off, um, normally there'll be introductions, uh, quite often you'll have a more than one facilitator, so you might have two, sometimes three, uh, people who are facilitating the focus group and they'll lead the discussion. And you'll normally start with some quite broad opening questions and go around the table or around the room and give each person a chance to answer one or two questions. Uh, and so they'll, they'll be pretty broad and easy for people to uh, say what they think. And then as you get further through the time, uh, you will start to move into uh, questions where you might just open it up to the room and let anyone answer rather than going around each specific question and then eventually move to your key questions. So the things that you really want to find out. Uh, you will then normally kind of have a little bit of a roundup where again you go around the room, uh, give each person a chance to speak because there might be things that they've thought of during the session. So some of the advantages of focus groups, you can certainly um, get synergy. You can have people who will say things and that will stimulate ideas uh, from other people. Uh, in terms of qualitative techniques, it's more efficient than an interview because we're dealing with six or eight or ten people at once rather than dealing with them individually. And there's quite a bit of flexibility. So a, a trained focus group facilitator uh, will often be able to get very good data out of a group. There is certainly a bit of an art to it. Um, if you do get the chance to run a focus group, you'll find that the first couple of times that you do it, it's uh, a lot harder than you would think. Some of the disadvantages, um, you can sometimes get a bit of um, interpersonal, not necessarily conflict, but um, people with different ideas. And so sometimes you'll get, you may get some people who are a little bit dominant. One of the roles of the facilitator is to allow everyone to be able to share their opinion without being influenced by others. So they need to be firm enough that they're not having uh, these dominant people affect what other people are saying, but at the same time you don't want to completely shut them up because you are interested in what they have to say. Uh, the results of the focus group, certainly there's um, the interpretation of them is subjective. So this means that if two different people listen to a recording of a focus group, they might draw slightly different conclusions. Uh, as I said before, the facilitation or the moderation uh, running a focus group is actually pretty tricky, um, particularly if, if you get some um, energetic and opinionated people. Uh, so finding people who are good at running them um, can take, take a bit of time or to train people up does certainly take a bit of practice. With all our qualitative techniques, one of, one of our disadvantages is that we can't generalise. What one particular group of people says doesn't necessarily reflect on a whole population of people. So focus groups are very good if we want to try and gather ideas, so particularly ideas around new products or uh, opinions on old products. So for our market research, uh, it's a lot more efficient if we've got, say, eight or ten people there and they're telling us uh, perhaps we're designing a new product, we have a prototype, and we can say, well, this is, this is what we think we're going to make, and getting feedback from a reasonable number of people all at once. Uh, it can help us with designing our quantitative studies as well. So based on what people say in a focus group might uh, help help us decide what we are going to put into a survey for our quantitative analysis. So an um, in-depth interview is uh, our next qualitative technique. And so these can be structured or unstructured. Structured interview will be where you have a set of questions and unstructured is where you really go in with uh, kind of some themes that you want to talk about. And so depending on what kind of information you are trying to find out from people will depend on quite how much structure you go with. You might have set questions and then put in little bits and pieces in between or you might just completely go with whatever the, uh, that your participants are saying. Uh, so you have an interviewer, and again, like with a focus group, there's definitely a, uh, a real art and a real skill to be able to 
do a good job of running an interview. And this time, instead of a room of respondents, you'll just have a single respondent. Uh, typically, you might have 30 minutes to an hour interview, uh, but these can certainly be longer, um, particularly with social research. Uh, quite often with academic research, you might have interviews that are, say, two or three, sometimes even four hours. Um, with those, though, you need to you need to bear in mind that if your interviews are going to be three or four hours long, you're probably only going to be able to manage one or two per day. And if you've got a certain number that you need to get through, this could be quite, quite time consuming. With an in-depth interview, it's going to be easier for you to be able to probe and respond to what people say. You can do this to some degree in a focus group, but you're dividing your attention across a room full of people. In an in-depth interview, when someone says something interesting, you can continue to probe, continue to ask them what, what they mean, and get more information. So this is one of the ways that we can get very in-depth information. You can have someone sitting there for half an hour to an hour sharing a lot of thoughts. If you're talking about uh, sensitive issues, an uh, in-depth interview is certainly far better than a focus group. People may be embarrassed in a focus group to reveal things in front of other people, whereas in an interview they tend to be much more willing to open up and talk to you. Very flexible as well. So you're able to react to what the person is saying, you're able to steer the conversation to find out the kind of information that you want. Again, uh, some of those disadvantages are the same as with the focus groups, so interpreting interview transcripts is certainly very subjective. Uh, doing interviews is a particular skill, so you can't assume that you can just instruct a staff member to go and do interviews, you really need them to have done some training first. Uh, and again, we can't generalize, and they're more expensive and time-consuming. If you're dealing with one person at a time instead of a room full, uh, it's going to take you longer. They are very powerful, though, so we can gain a lot of insight, particularly if you have respondents who have um, a lot of things to say, a lot of opinions. Um, In-depth interview is going to allow you to draw that information out of them, so you can get a lot more detailed information. Sometimes, uh, and particularly in academic work, quite often you'll find in-depth interviews as a follow-up to surveys. So you've conducted your survey, you've found out a whole lot of qualitative, uh, quantitative information about a group of people, and then you're doing follow-up just with some of them to ask more in-depth. So why, why they think particular things are the way they are. It's very good for confidential or embarrassing topics. Uh, or anything else where people are unlikely to want to talk in front of others. Uh, so it takes us longer, but a very powerful method for getting detailed information. Okay, so our last group of techniques, uh, this one's a bit more broad, are called projective techniques. So they're more commonly what we call indirect, and so indirect would mean that their purpose is disguised. This isn't always the case, or sometimes it's um, not so much that they're disguised, but they um, the participants will kind of know what, what it is you're trying to find out from them. Uh, but other times it can be very unclear. You're getting some people to do something, uh, you're observing what they're doing uh, in order to find out some information. So quite often involves simulated activities uh, and some sort of observation. So it could be observation that the participants are aware of, or it could be a little bit more covert. So you can imagine getting a room uh, with a person or people, giving them your product, and perhaps uh, either video recording or watching them through a... Um, through a one-way mirror and just seeing what they're doing. So rather than asking them directly, just perhaps getting them using your product or trying your product and observing what they're doing. And you may find that even though they said one particular thing about your product, when you observed how they used it, what they did with it, it was actually quite different. So some examples of projective techniques. Uh, some of the more basic ones would be things like word association and sentence completion and story completion. So this is where instead of asking a question, we might get people to do word matching, we might give them pictures and 
get us to tell them about pictures. Uh, we might say, here's a here's a set of pictures. Which of these people look like our our potential consumers or people that would use our product? So some of them are pretty pretty basic. And so whilst we are not being as explicit as if we were directly asking people, what do you think about our product? Um, they can still probably see through it pretty easily. We're not we're not necessarily being that subtle. Uh, some of the more interesting ones though can involve things like role playing. So we may actually get people engaging with using our product or uh, otherwise doing things that observing what they're doing is going to give us information. One of the more interesting ones that I've been involved with was actually as a participant, and I got taken to a warehouse where the market research company had built a pretend retail store and they'd built everything out of cardboard so it looked a little bit comical and they led me into this pretend cardboard store and then got me to pretend that I was consumer and I was going to the store and so they might say well let's imagine that you wanted to buy this certain type of product show us what you do and so I would wander around this pretend store and I would pretend to be a shopper and they would observe observe me see how I moved around the store see how easily I found things and what they were doing is they were trying to come up with the best particular design for all of the stores that they have so projective techniques uh, can be very good for finding out about behaviors and particularly things that can be hidden from direct techniques. We may ask someone, what do you do when you're in a store? But they may tell you one thing which is actually different from what they do. Uh, so it doesn't even, you can see there I've listed uh, issues where things are personal or sensitive. Um, but even, even fairly basic things, uh, it gives us a different way of looking at behaviours. The downside is that it's very, very subjective. So all the disadvantages of the other uh, methods are uh, of being very subjective, hard to interpret. Uh, they can be very complex and time consuming. Uh, and for some types, only certain types of people will be willing to participate. Some people won't want to be observed um, because they may be embarrassed about whatever it is that you're observing them. Uh, having said that though, uh, they can also be very powerful. Uh, and in terms of running them, I think both as a participant and as uh, the, the facilitator, they can be a lot of fun as well. This has been a Swinburne production.